How are you guys? Good. How are you doing? Good. Good. I'm going out of town in the morning for three days. Go see my granddaughters in Houston. That's a good place. That's a good place to visit. Texas. It's supposed to be 93 tomorrow. He's not Where used to the heat anymore. <laughs> I'm definitely not used to the heat. We're in Texas, Kurt. Houston. Okay. My sister and husband just got back from Plano outside of Dallas, Fort Worth, and uh, it was hot. Hot all over Texas, I think. Yeah. As, well, it's as John burning, knows. burning in hell. It's burning in hell because of its laws. <laughs> Is, uh, hey, Jake, are you on? Can you hear me? Hey, Jake is on, but he's got both his camera and his mic off. Hey, Ron, is Jake going to take care of public comments? Uh, yes, he will. Okay. And uh, yeah. it is yep. the magic noon time. Well, I'd like to, it's 12 o'clock, I'd like to call the meeting to order for the Board of uh, Commissioners for Whidbey Health. Uh, basically, whenever anybody's talking, realize we are recording this, and uh, make sure you speak up and state your name. Uh, any public comments, Jake will be handling. So, at this time, I would like to go into the first part, the consent agenda. Move approval of the agenda. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. <laughs> uh, I'd like to have you know call call the order points of order. Are there any points of order? Any corrections? None. Okay, moving on. At this time, if there's any public comment, uh, Jake, would you let us know? Hello, Jake. Jake. Sorry, okay. You. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, right. we do have one uh, member of the public that would like to speak. Um, <laughs> Melanie, are you able to um, make uh, Ms. Sanchez a... Oh, you, you have made her panels. Okay, great. She has. Uh, Celia, you are welcome to make a comment. Uh, again, guidelines for the com public comment periods. We uh, The board will not have a response at this time, but uh, please keep your comments between three to five minutes, and um, you're welcome to unmute and go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. This is Celia, and I am part of the UFCW21. And I'm here representing members who are unable to participate due to working. And I would like to address and request the board's attention on the unfair labor practice complaint that was filed uh, for Whidbey. Uh, staff have not received their retro pay uh, that was ratified and voted on June 25th. And I'm just seeking the board's attention and addressing this right now. Staff are feeling uh, to say the least, um, devalued and underappreciated uh, with the circumstances. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other public comments, Jake? Uh, I do not see any, but if I'll maybe leave it another two minutes uh, or a minute or so if there are any other persons that would like to make a comment. Um, it looks like there was one comment that was came into the chat. Um, in June, this administration made a proposal for new union contracts for ProTech and service and support. Union accepted. It went to vote and was ratified. Since that time, excuses have been many for not implementing pay increases. I didn't know that was a final proposal. We are hoping by end of July, the payroll person is sick. This stalling is grossly affecting employees 
and their families. When is this administration going to walk its talk? Um, so I, that's, that's it for public comments. Um, and uh, if I, well, I, I do have a response, but this may not be the appropriate forum for it. Okay. okay, okay, we can talk later. Moving on uh, to medical staff report. Dr. Scheidt, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Um, first, um, continue to encourage our public to get vaccinated. Uh, our all staff yesterday, and it was um, complete agreement from all the providers on this island, whether they work for the hospital directly or in private practice, that we value vaccines and we want everyone to remain safe. It's been taxing on us as providers and we just hope everyone stays safe. So we just wanna encourage that, continue for those who haven't been vaccinated to get their vaccine. It's safe and reliable. And next I'd like to give uh, my report for credentials for initial appointment. We have Dr. Dargo for telepsych, Dr. Daniel Gladstone for pediatric, Dr. Labiche for telestroke for pro, uh, provisional, Holly Vance, ARNP for internal medicine hospitalist provisional, Dr. Williams, OB Gyn provisional, and Dr. Zuleda, family medicine hospitalist provisional. These are initial appointments. Move approval of initial appointments. Second. Second. Been moved and second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Move. Advance. Okay. Sorry. Advance. Uh, for courtesy, these are all going to be courtesy. Dr. Uh, Ekopov, Telestroke, Dr. Atwal, Telestroke, Dr. Beltaji. Telestroke, Dr. Bot, Telestroke, Dr. Bhattacharya, I'm not going to say that right, Telestroke, Dr. Finale, Telestroke, Dr. Farouk, Telestroke, Dr. Freeberg, Telestroke, Dr. Frischman, Telestroke, Dr. Giles, Dr. Judd, Dr. Kensari, Dr. Lada, Dr. Lowenkopf, Dr. Mao, Dr. Marvi, Dr. Merchandani, Dr. Okan, Dr. Ovian, uh, Dr. Patel, Dr. Rontel, Dr. Seishar, Dr. Sapkota, Dr. Wagner, uh, Dr. Wong, Dr. White, those are all telestroke, courtesy staff. Next is Andy Lum, uh, certified registered nurse anesthetist for anesthesia for courtesy staff. Dr. Dixon for uh, internal medicine, primary care Freeland, Dr. or excuse me, PA Campbell, for orthopedic surgery, and Marcus Kuypers for emergency medicine courtesy. Those are all uh, advancements. Move approval of advancements. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. So moved. Okay, and for reappointments, we have Alicia Darb, certified nurse midwife at the Women's Clinic, Michelle Gasper, or Dr. Gasper, pediatrics, Allison Cadis, uh, family medicine, primary care, Freeland, and Dr. Nikotu, internal medicine hospitalist. These are for reappointments and active staff. Move approval of reappointments. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Dr. Scheidt, did you have some policies that you needed to bring forward? Um, hold on. I'm, I lost my computer connection, so. There aren't any in the packet. So. Yeah, I didn't think we had any today. 
It was on the agenda, but none in the packet. That's what I was wondering. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think we had any at MEC. We didn't have any this this week. I think we pushed them out until next meeting. So. Okay. Any anything else? Other than wanting everybody to get out and get vaccinated, it's safe and secure. <laughs> get That's it. That's right. That's it. Okay. That's the message. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to staff and status reports from the administration, human resource, Debbie. Debbie, are you muted? Debbie? Oh, Debbie. Debbie, we can't hear you or see you or see you. She might have been on. Uh, why don't we move on and then come back to it? Okay, maybe I've seen her up there earlier. Oh, wait a minute. She's there she in. is. Can I just jump in here? Yeah. They can't. Okay. Back here. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm using the uh, boardroom to speak to. We'll look first at clinic recruitment status. A lot of provider recruiting going on right now, working on getting several more providers for Cabot in order to address the panel and the wait times that patients have to get in to see a provider or to be able to have a new provider. Uh, Carol is incorrectly listed at Cabot. He's actually accepted a position to go to uh, primary Freeland. And then you can see the other names coming up. Jay Milleron, Annette Fly. Um, some of these are still in negotiations and discussions. If you go to the next slide. So that's what this last yeah. column means, that we don't actually have them signed up yet. We're talking exactly. About so whereas there are open positions uh, like orthopedics, it shows that there's an open one, we need to close that, but um, it, it looks like there's one and there's no candidates in the queue. For surgery though, we do have doctors Keating and Babazada who are looking at per diem positions and just had real successful interviews. And with women's clinic, we just welcomed Dr. Justin Williams just a couple weeks ago, he started with Wiggy Health. And we are in discussions with Dr. Kayab Yam for per diem and Dr. Knight as a potential 1.0 SPE. And then for women's clinic, looking at certified nurse midwives, Chanti Colo and Fair Play. Go to the next slide. Talk about hiring challenges and you know, not just providers, but across the entire organization there, you can drive down any street in any town and you see signs all over the place. Everybody's hiring. They're having to reduce their hours, reduce their services. And so it is a real challenge and even more so in healthcare, of course, in the state of Washington with the vaccine mandates that's coming down. We are having staffing issues related to that, and we'll talk more about that as we go through the deck, but we are concerned about losing employees and recruiting due to that, but we want to follow the mandate and do what's right and protect our patients. But we don't even have our a choice. Patients. It's not, a, it's not an option. No. We're, no. We have to follow the mandate. Correct, and, and we are doing so. Yeah. So to that end, though, we are trying to make vaccination easier for employees, and we have had on-site vaccine clinics. We'll have additionals coming. We've been promoting the dates in terms of what would be the last first day for the first of a two-dose series and what will be the last day for the second dose or for the one-dose series so that we are in full compliance and people are two weeks post final vaccine before October 18th to be in full compliance with the mandate. And so 
as we're going towards that, we're having those discussions in hiring so that we're talking to candidates up front to make sure that they understand that, you know, we'll need to be fully vaccinated. Employees today that are not fully vaccinated are wearing um, medical grade protective masks and, <clears throat> excuse me, and employees that have a religious or medical exemption approved will also be wearing the masks. But as of October 18th is a very difficult day when they're some employees that we will lose at that point because of this. So, so after the 18th, a new employee comes, it would, you know, because we tell them they have to get vaccinated. Yes. If they're not vaccinated. And then would there be a waiting period? No. Of 14 days? Or? No, thanks for asking that question. The state has clarified that they must be in compliance at that point. So if we have a candidate who's in the process, of getting compliant, we would just have to wait for their start date to be two weeks post yeah, the final vaccination. Yeah. Yes. So going so down the road after October 18th. We have to wait. It'll always be a two week waiting period if they have not been vaccinated. Yeah. Or, or more if yeah. they're doing a two dose series yeah. or where they're at in that right. series. Okay. Of time yes, yeah. exactly. Thank you for asking. We're on top of that. Good. So that, that does delay some hiring, but we still go forward and are trying to work with candidates so there aren't surprises at the very end of that hiring process. Right. Okay, so updates. We do have a financial wellness webinar series that we've been advertising. Uh, we partner, of course, with AIG Valley, and they'll be putting out webinars every Thursday through September and at various times we've asked for it to be different times to accommodate our employees across the ship. And so we're going to see how those times work out and which are the best attended to continue to offer future series. So we know now more than ever, one of the great benefits that we offer is around financial planning, the way that we partner uh, with retirement and for people to better understand and, and use those tools. The LTC update is long-term care, also a state of Washington. That tax will go into effect January 1st of 22. So we've been doing a lot of communication in advance of that to one, make people aware that it's coming and two, that there is a choice in, it's a one-time opt-out in the state of Washington. If you opt out and submit that to the state by the end of October, then you'll be able to opt out. Otherwise, mandated by the state and payroll, will be enrolling every employee. And in January, you would start seeing that come out of payroll. So there are multiple choices out there. Uh, one of our benefit providers and partners is WIT, and so we have been sending a lot of communication about that. They did have a little technical glitch, and so they actually extended the enrollment period for us until Friday, until the 10th of September. Uh, so if people are interested in that choice or looking into others, you know, there's time for others. If you have additional questions about that, you can come to HR. Can you send out a, a website or an email to, yes. okay. But they can't opt out and not do anything. They have to, no, if they're have opting to out, they have to get their own, yes. you know, yes. private. Yes, private. Yeah, so people don't quite coverage. understand that, that it's just not a matter of opting oh, out. Oh, no. No, that you, they you have gotta have to have exactly. proof that they've got it elsewhere. Yes, the state will require proof of alternate coverage. Yeah. Otherwise, the mandate and the taxation will So will maybe follow. you could send it out again we'll one more time? Again. Um, it's actually coming out this afternoon oh, again from HR. Okay that there's two more days with WIT and we'll do the countdown, but we'll also continue in the coming weeks and months so that people understand. The state has not uh, published the form yet. It's due by October 1st. They'll publish that form. We'll send the link and we'll also send that document out to employees. So if they're choosing to do the waiver that they'll be able to. Isn't it uh, Oh, well, you better hurry. I'm sorry, I can't understand. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so any questions about long-term care, 
feel free to pop into HR or pop by my office. Now, in terms of exemptions, because of the vaccine, there are two exemptions allowed, a medical exemption or a religious exemption. And we have been seeing a few medical exemptions trickle in and expect to see more. We have had about fourfold for religious exemptions, and the ELT reviews those. And everybody that's been approved so far has been communicated with. A couple people were asked to resubmit and better articulate how the vaccine specifically conflicts with their deeply held religious beliefs. So we'll continue to be processing those in the coming weeks. In terms of process improvements in the HR department, we've continued reevaluating the onboarding process. And as we are breaking down the silos from specialists to a generalist model, we have more cross training and really more agility to deal with as staffing ebbs and flows even within our own department. And so that has been making a big difference. Partnership strongly with education also in terms of how we look at the student onboarding process. It had been challenged, uh, admittedly, in the past, and we're real excited about those process improvements as well as volunteers that were slowly starting to be able to invite back into the organization. And they will also get to go through orientation and a very similar flow of how that works. So exciting to see those updates. We did talk about the recruiting challenges, but the next few slides I'd like to look specifically at uh, terminations and how we're doing. This is a different view than we've looked other months. This makes it easier to see throughout the year, the terminations by month. Now, this is without the RIF. These are terminations self-selected, okay? Otherwise, you would see a higher number there in March. And the reason it's the end of month August projection is these slides are prepared earlier. So. Uh, that there may be another one or two in there. And then as we go through the slides, we continue to break down and look at the reasons, other direction, and we continue to break down why people are leaving. And so about half, it just says resignations, and we get more information in exit interviews by asking people, you know, what would make them resign. Now we're starting to hear more of people choosing to exit the organization due to the vaccine. Um, and so we will start to see that reason as a, represented in September's numbers, uh, but they weren't all in here just yet. Some people, it was just moving, but there's a military connection because of the community. But really, in each category, we continue to ask the five whys, you know, okay, why are you moving, why that, why that? Now, another interesting view here is to look at, in terms of some of the recruiting challenges, how many people are leaving the organization and how many are hiring. So, for example, right now, we have over 130 open positions, which is a very high number. However, for an organization over 700, the turnover number in this organization has hovered more around 80 to 100. And so it's actually not as bad as some of our other local uh, competitors have threefold right now on their open positions. And so it's this constant battle of not only is it tough to hire in any industry right now and the extra additional challenges that we've discussed in healthcare, but just our own revolving, okay, for people that exit some of those openings, literally that's just to maintain headcount neutrality. And so the more difficult it becomes to recruit people, the, the longer that candidacy is, is taking or the openings are taking. So we're going to continue looking at the metric of time to hire from the time that a rep is posted to the time that it is filled. We're getting several months of data there, and going forward, we'll be looking at that. The 
expectation here in the near future is that unfortunately that will probably even get a little longer before it continues to get better as we're making different choices. So right now we've had to rely on a lot of travelers and have some extra spending going out that way because of not being able to hire fast enough and that constant balance of trying to maintain patient safety and proper staffing levels without being able to hire fast enough. And so those are some of the reasons behind some of these numbers that you look at. So there's just uh, so much more that goes on behind in recruiting. In, in listening to the news, you know, they're talking about in the past, we were going to have a shortage of nurses and doctors. Yes, that you know, was predicted. That, well, You're right. yeah, five years ago, they're talking about how big a shortage there's going to yes. be. The, the pandemic hit. And a lot of these people are like, they're done with healthcare. Yeah. Correct. You know, that they're changing in it, it, it has nothing We're to do retiring with, early. Yeah, it has nothing to do with us or any of our competing hospitals. Correct. They're just they're leaving. They're, they're done with the healthcare because of that's why we're saying, you know, people need to get out and get vaccinated. That's a big thing. It's yeah. like as soon as we can get this under control, so we quit losing people. I mean, right now right. they're just so stressed out and uh, it's just it's crazy out there on this. So like it I said, it, it really skews your numbers, you know, when people are leaving and it's not because they're unhappy here, they're just out of the health care. Yeah, exactly. People are choosing to retire early or changing careers altogether. And so we have some positions, non-clinical positions, and they can just as easily, unfortunately, find employment in a different industry. Of course, that works for now. There's every chance there's a longer political discussion to be had on how long that lasts, and it could go across industries. But that is true today. There's another point that should be made about the travelers, too. Not only are we having to get more of them, but they're more and more expensive. Yes. They are outrageous. outrageous. We are competing. I see ads, uh, and I know my wife gets solicitations for $10,000 signing bonuses, yes. $6,000 a week. Uh, which obviously we can't afford. We can't compete with the very large hospitals no. who are drawing these people in at those kinds of pay. That kind yeah. of pay. And the fact is, we are paying some of of these fees. Um, I think uh, what Aaron is re is required to have these. Yeah, those staffing you know, levels. Staffing is required. Paying three hundred thousand a year on that, or was it a quarter? A year? In, in a bad quarter, yeah. That's a lot. But everybody's doing it. Right. Everybody is doing it. Yes, that's a very fair statement. And you know, back you have this horrible choice. You're either going to have this appropriate staffing ratio, or you're not going to be able to have as many patients. And so you end up paying it in order to keep the beds. It's it's very difficult position right yeah. now. Any questions? Are you going to fix it? Oh, yeah. so wait, my next one. Hey, you, you asked. And we need you to do it by the next board meeting. Yeah. Excellent. Will you take incremental improvements, please? <laughs> well, well what are we going to do? What are you going to do but for seriously? for entry level positions? Um, you go ahead. So we have a proposal that we're looking at. How can we correct um, the lower and of the wage scales around here as we're competing with McDonald's, right? And so we value our people. And so we have just gone through what the increases are that are going to all the wage scales and the back pay. And then the union with whom I interact that have the lowest wage earners, I've already advised them that I'd like to, once we finish that up, have discussion about how we can do more for the lower end of the scales and make it far more competitive. And while that's challenging in this economic climate, we know that we have to look at it. And so we're hoping to be able to spend more money and do even more for wages but we waited one for a wage survey to come out and we now have very current data so that one, we can look at regionally, how competitive are we? But then we also have the local cost of living, which I think anybody here knows it's impressive, right? And so it's very difficult for people to afford to live on the island. It's also difficult to find housing. And so to that end, we've been working to identify housing and to provide options for people coming in that there was a time a few months ago we had discussions that people were turning down positions because they couldn't find housing 
And so as we continue to hear what the challenges are, we are trying to overcome them. How many of the 130 open positions are entry-level positions? That is an excellent question, and I will get you an exact percentage before this give, meeting is over. Give me a ballpark. Is it most of them? No. Less, less than a third? No, because our ends, of course, are a larger part of the population in general. So just demographically for the organization, it, it wouldn't be a larger percentage anyway. So I'm going to say 23, 25% in the lower wage earners. And then we have... A strong need across all positions, but the clinical positions, especially from MAs to RNs, very difficult to fill. It is a, a challenge in which we are dealing with, and and I know it that uh, we are all looking at it, um, and that uh, one thing is we're looking at short term and we're looking at long term. Exactly. Um, we have ideas on long term we would like uh, to present in the future, uh, but right now we just keep it quiet. Yes, more on that in the coming months. And I did invite that question. Dare I ask if there are any others? <laughs> yeah, All right, I, thank, I, you. thank you. I do have a question. Oh, uh, in view of the questions that were brought up before the meeting from the public, um, is that something that should be, uh, I mean, you're talking about dealing with lower wages and things like that, but we still have some issues with the union? Well, I think the most polite way to say it is that there's a genuine misunderstanding there. On our end, while it was ratified by a union, there hadn't been a signature received, and there was a question about going forward and implementing those wage scales without us receiving signed documentation. And I don't want to get into that too much here, but and I it think, is being implemented and it will appear on uh, the paycheck that's not this Friday, but the next Friday. And then on I, top of that, some of the other points that were, sorry, Jake. I just want to, I, I, and I, I want to clarify too that um, when the contract was sent out for ratification, unfortunately, a final agreement had not been reached between the employer and the union, and there were several items that were key items that had not been agreed upon. Uh, for example, the red line agreement that was sent out to me on the same day that the contract was sent out for ratification um, included increases to premium pay and other items that were significant and important that had not been agreed upon or bargained. Um, and those corrections were not finally agreed upon between the union and the employer until uh, as late as August 24th. And we didn't actually get finalized wage scales agreed upon between the, the union and the employer until as recently as I, I think within the past week or two. So it's unfortunate that the contract went out for ratification before it was actually finalized. Um, we weren't notified that it had gone out for ratification until the day that it was sent out for ratification. We're, we're extremely sorry that uh, it was not um, better communicated from, from both sides, uh, but we have worked to resolve the issues that are uh, very important. We can't really move forward in increasing uh, the wages as, as there should until we have our on the same page on both sides. And I think we're at that point and we will be moving forward and implementing them. But I, I needed to clarify that um, there was no meeting of the minds by the time that the contract had been sent out um, for ratification to its members. And that is, that is unfortunate, um, but we are, we are going to, we are moving forward and we have reached an agreement and we'll be getting that implemented. Thank you. And part of that implementation is that payroll, which will include the back pay because there were agreements about, you know, the day that it would have gone into effect and back paying to that day, that holds true. And, and uh, that is coming. They will see it on the following paycheck. We had hoped for it to be on the most recent paycheck that we just received, and that just didn't happen for multiple reasons. And, and there was one comment there uh, about you know, our excuses, um, one of which, and it's not an excuse, it's a reality, right? We've had illness 
within our own organization, a serious illness, and we're also shorthanded. So when you lose a chunk of your already short staff, it becomes very difficult to take on large projects, but the right thing is happening and that money will be there. Well, hopefully the union will get online there and she'll pass that on to the staff that is yes. being worked on. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry. Okay, moving on, our finance update. Jennifer, lots of good news for us, right? Not too bad. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Um, so, uh, for inpatient utilization, uh, you, you can see August was pretty busy, not quite as busy as July as far as admissions goes, but we're projected to end up the year right pretty close to budget. Um, also, you'll see in the length of stay that um, the patients uh, seem to be staying a little longer than projected. That's really due to uh, a couple of visitors that we had for quite some time. So that sort of skewed the numbers a little bit. As you can see by the patient days of 3,323 days in um, our projected numbers, uh, we just had a few staying for quite a while. Our average daily census is uh, projected to be 6% over budget. And uh, the census in, June, in August, sorry, was uh, just a little over 12 patients a day. Any questions about that? Okay. Okay. Nope. Okay, and then outpatient utilization, I added a few numbers for you, just uh, I guess to fill up the page. <laughs> Um, you can see emergency room, they've been really busy over the last two months and the projections are leveling out to come close to our target number. Uh, the walk-in clinics are really busy, uh, but um, unfortunately due to some provider issues, they're, they're just a little under their targets. So I've also added for you diagnostic imaging and lab and rehab and MAC visits. Um, we, we haven't shown those really in the past, so um, they're all really busy. And um, let's see, I guess, unless there are any questions there, I'll just go on to the next page, which might be the good news. So once again, in July, we had a really, um, large gross patient charges, um, almost, well, 23 million, um, almost 23 and a half million dollars in gross patient charges. Uh, that you can see the adjustments to revenue and we ended up at almost $10 million for the month in net, net patient revenues. Our operating expenses were uh, a little over 9.5 million and then add depreciation and we had a net operating revenue of three hundred and almost sixty thousand dollars. That is after depreciation, Nancy. <laughs> so that's a good number. Um, all this aside, uh, now we just have to wait for the cash to come in, right? And our AR days are pretty high up there, and our accounts receivable are pretty high. But we started to see it coming in for sure in um, August, uh, we had good days um, increasing our cash, not increasing our cash, but um, good deposits. So if you have the next slide, please. Maybe. As you can see on the uh, current assets, that's your bank balance, just, just a bit over 10 days of cash. Uh, that's because your net accounts receivable is high and at over 65 days in collections. Once we see that coming in and we're working on decreasing those accounts receivable, then our bank balance should go up. So let's see, that's nothing else in, on this balance sheet really has changed too much. Um, but Jennifer, I, I have a question about yep. this sheet, please. 
Close. Getting back to the accounts receivable, um, we have 20,449,000 in accounts receivable. Um, next time, can you break that down into zero to 30 days, 30 to 60, 60 to 90 for us? Sure I can. Or is that, is that all, is that all over 60? Did I hear you say that? No, 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 no that all goes, no, you have all your range of accounts receivable wanna, there, right? Um, yeah. But, okay. yeah, the finance committee reviews um, the aging of the accounts receivable and this is what we're expecting to collect on this gross accounts receivable. And the days receivable is just a calculation, but sort of it is supposed to reflect how many days it takes from service to collection. And if I can add just a touch, Kurt, a large portion of this has been assigned to um, some folks, HRM, to collect on it because it's old stuff, it's big stuff and they're getting some results. So that will help change that around soon too. This is all because of denials and various other things, a multitude of things, but it's being addressed and um, it should be reversing beginning next month. Okay, and re remind us again, what is the, the uh, age threshold for turning it over to the collection uh, people? Is it over 60, and over 90? 90 days, yep. 90 days. We did that for staffing reasons, and now our staff that we have now is able to concentrate on the zero to 90 days. And I have se seen um, pretty good uh, decreases on the zero to 90 days. And then as HRG starts collecting more and more, I think we'll see that go down. Any other questions? Next slide. So this is just a cash flow projection for the rest of the year. It shows you where our cash has gone um, from January to July. And then, oh, I got to move you guys out of the way. <laughs> and then the last column is projected from July to December, including some projects we have going on and our air handlers. The, that's money we're going to have to spend there. Uh, the $2.4 million will be coming in as um, tax levy revenue and going right back out at $2.5 million. Or, yep. And then uh, that $6 million is an estimated settlement from our cost report. And the $2.2 million is money go going to be paid back at, from our Medicare advance. So I'm projecting at this point to have 21 days of cash by the end of the year. I got questions about that. That was fast. I do have a question, uh, Jennifer, about the second line, the yep. uh, net change in tax levy revenue. I is that the property tax levy, and if That's, so, why is it negative for some months? What, don't we receive it every month? So what we do is we um, we apply the revenue evenly throughout the year, and then when it comes in, it comes in in chunks. It comes in every month, but it comes in big chunks in some of the months. So when you see it negative, uh, that means the tax money that came in didn't quite cover how much we were projecting on an even keel, if that makes sense. So you okay. see, in okay. May, we get our large deposit. So that means it, it went to the positive, right? So we collected more than we booked. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, you average it out over 12 months, yep. and if what you receive doesn't meet that, then it shows as negative. Right, because this is on a cash basis. Yep. So I'm 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 estimating 1.1 million dollars over, um, oh, more than we say is revenue from July to December. Hope that makes okay. sense. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? And I think that's all, unless you have questions. Hey, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Hey, moving on to outpatient clinic report, Dr. Miller. Good afternoon. Um, so the highlight and the themes continue. Uh, the clinics uh, struggle with 
lack of staffing as probably our biggest obstacle to serving our patients and growing. We have uh, 35 open positions. Uh, about half of them are entry level positions that we are struggling to fill. And that impacts our operations and the patient experience, despite our, all our efforts otherwise. Uh, let's talk about Cabot. Cabot is our largest clinic. Um, a year ago, we had eight providers. We dropped down to four due to departures. We have uh, brought on uh, NP Burnett, so that makes five. Um, we are actively recruiting two additional candidates. One offer has been made, another is coming in for an in-person interview. Uh, we have a provider that's splitting his time between uh, the Cabot Clinic and the Walking Clinic to try to try to staff both, both areas. Um, we had been struggling on the technology side with our phones. The phones appear to be dramatically improved at Cabot as of just the last few days. And we hope that that will continue and will be reflected in our patient experiences. Um, we still, still are struggling with uh, some computer connectivity issues. You may uh, hear more about that from uh, Mr. Mello. Um, Overall, you know, we're kind of holding the line at Cabot. Uh, we hope to bring in more providers and get our technological issues resolved, and then we can grow and serve more patients. Freeland, uh, Freeland, uh, we are losing one provider this month, but are replacing him with another provider who will start in January, uh, PA Malyron. We're excited about that. The, the clinic staffing has just recently improved in Freeland and hopefully that will also be reflected soon with our patient experience scores. Uh, we, we have had some intermittent phone issues there as well, and that's currently being investigated as well. In our walk-in clinics, we really struggled with provider staffing uh, due to illnesses and uh, departures, and uh, we've actually had to reduce hours and close uh, several of our walk-in clinics several days this past month. Um, we just uh, signed a contract with a new full-time provider, uh, PA Carroll. We're excited to bring him on board within the next couple months. And we have two additional candidates that we are uh, pursuing uh, part-time and full-time. Uh, volumes continue to grow in our walk-in clinics. Um, unfortunately, part of that is COVID and uh, respiratory symptom patients a recent analysis of 200 patients showed that uh, with respiratory symptoms showed that 12% of them were positive for COVID. So the pandemic is really hitting us hard in the community right now. It's affecting our patients and our staff and our providers and uh, making a difficult situation even, even worse. Uh, in our uh, medical inventory, care clinics oncology is stable right now we're still looking for a manager in wound care we have opened we've expanded it to five days a week dr robinson has joined our provider staff there and the service continues to grow and develop uh, general surgery we have two full-time general surgeons that are busy we have two per diems that help fill uh, the call coverage and two more have, have applied as uh, debbie uh, DeCordy has mentioned. So we're hopeful that we can run general surgery with two full times and per diems. If volumes continue to grow, we may look at hiring another third full-time general surgeon. In orthopedic surgery, uh, the total joint practice continues to grow. Our data is showing significant slow but steady increase in the number of patients every month. The quality metrics are showing yeah, shortened length of stay, reduced um, morbidity and mortality related data. Overall, things are looking really great with our total joint program right now. Um, in women's care, as you know, we've kind of redesigned the service line. We have two full-time OBGYN providers. Dr. Williams just joined us. Um, we are 
uh, looking for a, at least one more full time and then probably another one for call. And as far as the nurse midwives, we are looking for two additional nurse midwives. We've had lots of good applicants for that, those two positions, and hopefully we will be making some offers uh, very soon uh, to fully staff uh, the women's care clinic and labor and delivery unit with three nurse midwives. In our sleep clinic, staffing continues to be a, a difficult, particularly for sleep techs. Uh, we've at one point, we had two sleep techs, two nocturnal sleep techs and one daytime sleep tech. We are down to just one part-time sleep tech and that is affecting uh, the volume of sleep studies that we can do. And that actually was reflected in the financial statistics that you saw. Um, so uh, in summary, our clinics are doing the best they can under difficult uh, staffing arrangements and and uh, trying to deal with our pandemic. Dr. Miller, um, I don't have a question about what you said, but I wanted to commend you and, and the other members of the team for uh, arranging to get Dr. Corson, the cardiologist, uh, to join us. Uh, he's impressive, and I was very impressed with his presentation yesterday. Um, could you talk a little bit about how patients are, can be referred to him? Yes, Dr. Corson is a cardiologist. He, uh, he spent many years working at the University of Washington system at Harborview. He lives on Whidbey Island and he uh, retired from the university system and is now offering his services to us on a part-time basis. The most urgent need we had for him to fill was for outpatient cardiac stress testing. And he is now overseeing all the cardiac stress testing that's done on an outpatient basis. And uh, the primary care, our primary care providers refer patients to him for those studies. Um, I am talking with him and we are exploring the possibility of expanding the services that he provides to include event reporting, uh, which is another big need for our uh, patients on Whidbey Island, and perhaps to do some other uh, things as well. So the very good news is that people on the island no longer have to leave the island for stress tests. That's correct. Yes. And where will the stress tests take place at? Here at the hospital? Clinic. Yes, they occur at the hospital. Yeah, we need to get that info out. <clears throat> is that it, Dr. Miller? That is it. Thank you. Moving on to the nursing report, Erin Woolley. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for letting me. Uh, share a few things with you. I'll keep my report fairly brief and uh, just update you on um, a few things COVID related, a few things um, recruiting related, and then a few of the other projects that are um, in the works. So um, you know, we've spoken quite a bit about the vaccine mandate and um, we, as Debbie shared, we are offering some other clinic opportunities here for our employees so that those um, that uh, are ready now to receive their vaccine have easy access to vaccine through Whidbey Health. So we'll do another prime dose clinic on Friday and uh, some boost doses are coming up here. Certainly our employees have the option of receiving their vaccines elsewhere. So um, vaccine is widely available at all of the retail pharmacies and uh, Island County Public Health has been doing some pop-up clinics. In fact, I think I believe they had one um, at the music festival this weekend. So we're certainly, uh, we want to make sure that folks know that they have easy access uh, to free vaccine and uh, are happy to continue to help provide that here. Um, so we'll get everybody vaccinated against COVID and then uh, flu season is around the corner. So we'll be getting everybody vaccinated against the flu as well. So those, those are uh, fun times for all of us. I get excited about giving vaccines so I could talk about that all day long. Um, you know, as Dr. Miller shared, and, and as I usually share, I think it is important to know that the rate of COVID-19 activity across our island 
um, is rising. It's at the highest level uh, that it's been throughout the pandemic. So um, the vast majority of people that are contracting COVID right now are unvaccinated. Of course, there are breakthrough cases within those that are vaccinated, but they are few and far between, and they are usually very mild illnesses when they do happen. So um, I would strongly encourage people to continue not only to seek vaccine um, and, and go ahead and get vaccinated, but also to continue to limit non-essential travel and to continue to mask indoors and outdoors and, um, you know, and really think about how we can stop the spread of COVID-19. Uh, we've seen about 25% of patients in our inpatient uh, unit today, in fact, are uh, ill with COVID-19 and the uh, vast majority of those uh, patients are unvaccinated folks. So um, again, I, I, you know, we, we're all here to support this vaccine and support keeping this community healthy, but COVID is on the rise. I think uh, case rate, the last time that it was published by Island County, um, so it's about a week old now, the information I have, but I believe it was over 350 cases per 100,000. So um, we'll see what uh, Thursday's numbers look like. They share that information tomorrow, but we're seeing a lot of COVID activity in our ERs and our inpatient units. And, uh, you know, we really do want this community to be safe and healthy. So get vaccinated, take the appropriate precautions. We know we've seen it. We know that uh, the precautions help. We know that we can stop the spread and this community's done it before. So uh, now is time to, uh, you know, um, really take these precautions seriously and help uh, get this pandemic across our island back under control. So we've talked a lot about recruitment and I am um, happy to share some, some positive movement there um, and some promotions. So uh, just uh, congratulations and excitement around uh, Lacey who's been promoted to the manager of Transitions of Care. So for those of you that don't know what Transitions of Care is, these are our utilization management nurses and our discharge planning nurses and our entire social work team. Uh, so Lacey is, uh, leading this group of folks and I'm excited to have her in that role. And then uh, Tabitha has been promoted into the full-time manager of our birthplace. So I'm thrilled about that as well. And she's been working in an interim capacity with the birthplace and doing great work. And uh, now she can focus all of her attention on the birthplace. So these are some exciting moves for us and, and happy to have promoted from within and, and uh, happy to have these great nurse leaders working uh, with me and with our teams. Um, I'm also happy that we will be welcoming a trauma coordinator. Uh, Robin will be joining our team. In fact, uh, I think her first day is um, next week, next Monday. So I'm excited to get her uh, here and working in the trauma program and continuing the great work um, that Bert, our previous trauma coordinator, uh, has done in that role. And so while I have just a moment and a lot of attention, I completely this morning forgot to fully embarrass one of my team members and wish him a happy birthday. So I'm going to use uh, the benefit of having this platform to wish Bert a very happy birthday um, since we're talking about our trauma coordinator and uh, he's now one of our clinical informaticists. But uh, Bert, I apologize for not thoroughly embarrassing you this morning. And so please allow me to do that here on the board meeting um, in front of all of our attendees. So happy birthday, Bert. And uh, for those that are looking to join our healthcare team, um, as we've talked about, we, we certainly do have positions available and uh, are actively and eagerly uh, looking to welcome more people to our team. So the few of those needs are listed here and uh, you can certainly find all of our needs on our website. Um, it's been a lot of great work, in fact, to update our careers page. So it's even easier right now to look at our open positions and see what might be a good fit. So I'd encourage everybody to check out our careers page. Um, some great work between Connor and um, our HR team and Debbie DeCordy on uh, making some updates there. So check out that career page. There's plenty of positions available. So if we turn to the next slide, just a few of the works that are in progress um, and things that, that are happening here. So looking to reconvene our ethics committee. Um, so if there are folks on this uh, meeting that would be interested in joining us, um, we put together a charter and I've been having meetings with stakeholders that have been previously involved in the ethics committee. Um, so we're looking to get robust membership of this committee and uh, seeing how this uh, group can be a, a fruitful group uh, providing ethics consultations and educating our organization about medical ethics 
um, as well as reviewing policy and procedure. So reconvening that committee, um, and John uh, Scallum is actively involved in that and helping with that. He may speak more about that, I'm not sure, but uh, if you're interested, if you're listening and you want to uh, join, please reach out to me or John, we'll get you plugged in. Um, because of the amount of COVID activity that we are seeing, we are looking to create some extra space, um, some auxiliary space, specifically where um, folks that have respiratory illnesses and are suspected of having COVID can uh, remain within uh, one dedicated space and, and create this extra, extra room for COVID-19 patients or those that we suspect of having COVID. So um, if you're familiar with our organization, our, uh, what, we're, what we call affectionately our old PACU space, we're looking to um, outfit that space to be an auxiliary emergency department space. And so that work is ongoing right now, um, thanks to the surgical services team and the facilities team and the ER team for getting that ready so that we can uh, house a few more COVID patients in that space and help uh, you know, continue to segregate ill patients with uh, those that are um, ill, but not with uh, you know, communicable disease. So. Uh, some other exciting work that we are doing uh, through the National Emergency Telecritical Care Network, the NETCCN. Uh, this is a federal program that allows us to bring in a tele-intensivist program to Whitby Health. So I'm ex very excited about this. This is just going to be another tool in the arsenal that our hospitals and our ED providers have where they can quickly and easily through uh, a smartphone app access an intensivist provider uh, for consultation on critically ill patients. So um, we're bringing this program online very soon. And even right now, I'm happy to report that uh, several key uh, clinical leaders are attending a restraint and ligature safety course uh, that's being given by our accrediting agency, the DMV. And um, this is uh, a course about how to promote safety when we do place patients in restraints and how to um, minimize ligature risks. So a fantastic course that our accrediting agency is offering and uh, very thankful for the foundation funds that have allowed us to uh, secure spots in this course. And uh, the feedback that I'm getting from the team that's attending is that it's a very good course and uh, that fortunately they're not learning very much that's new. So I'm, I am glad about that. Um, I'm glad that there aren't any big surprises. I'm glad that uh, our work around restraints has been uh, very fruitful and successful work. If they were all learning new things, then uh, we, we would have we would have problems. So the fact that uh, it's just um, really cementing the education that they have is good news. And so that class is ongoing right now. And again, thanks to our foundation for supporting it. I'm happy to report that we are going to uh, host a cohort of Skagit Valley nursing students this fall. Um, so very soon they will uh, grace us again with their presence. It's always fun to have new nurses um, in the hospital and in, in the organization, they bring uh, such excitement and uh, opportunities for our team to share their tremendous amounts of knowledge and wisdom with uh, a new group of students. So I'm glad that that uh, process is underway. And we are actually also working on a process um, to facilitate education for one of our EMTs who is uh, going through paramedic training. So another great way that we can promote from within and grow our own um, and so excited to get that program up and running and hopefully we can uh, pull in more EMTs into that program so that we can facilitate their clinical experiences and uh, grow more paramedics. And then again, I think I've mentioned it before, but I uh, just wanted to share that we are working very hard with several different partner organizations to see if we can bring in some high fidelity simulation training uh, to practice those high risk and uh, low volume skills and really make sure that uh, we are ready to go for any of those kind of emergencies. So um, we've had some good conversations with um, the Providence Health System and uh, looking forward to meeting with the University of Washington about how we might be able to take advantage of uh, a partnership and using their high fidelity simulation training. So um, working hard with our education department on this and excited to bring that opportunity to Whitby Health. And that is about what I have to share today. Are there questions for me? Questions? Thank you, Aaron. Thank you report. all. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to quality report. John. Thank you, Commissioner Wallace. So regarding our uh, quality report here, um, 
The details are in pages 43 through 108 of the board packet. Uh, my apologies for uh, pages 87 through 108. Uh, in my desire to get the board packet over 100 pages, I didn't catch the formatting on the risk dashboard. So uh, we'll fix that moving forward. Um, I don't know if there's a contest to get as many possible things attached to the board uh, packet as possible, but do I win? 43 through 50 is the executive summary. Um, I'll be just covering that in brief here. Uh, we are still working on optimization of measure sets in Power BI. Uh, those were completed in August as planned. We have our infection prevention dashboards that are being completed right now, and we are working on uh, starting the architecture for our outpatient bill in a peanut health. From a MIPS standpoint, our 2020 score uh, was final dropped, and we are at a 92.3 out of 100. Uh, that adjusts our reimbursement for every Medicare Part D encounter in 2022 by a dollar fifteen uh, over base for every hundred dollars uh, received. So very strong performance uh, on the part of our staff and providers. From a patient experience standpoint, our composite mean is uh, fairly static. Uh, it's plateauing primarily due to the same issue that we see from inception, which is uh, regarding uh, access issues, um, timeliness of getting through, timeliness of return calls, uh, getting in for appointments. So basically, access to uh, the system, primarily in outpatient areas, uh, continues to be our, our main issue. We are currently working on that with uh, several uh, process improvement uh, initiatives. We're looking at staffing uh, the phone system itself. There's many things that are currently in the works, but it's still a uh, pretty complex problem that is being unraveled as we speak. Uh, customer service uh, uh, training in the form of all these behaviors were rolled out. We have been doing rounding on that. Uh, as a reminder on those customer service always behaviors, that was uh, really a, a frontline staff led uh, creation. And kudos to the uh, staff that are involved with the patient experience task force, because despite working uh, shorthanded and uh, having a lot of other competing uh, priorities, they have found the time to work with us on doing rounding, doing just in time uh, training, but that's ongoing and that's going to be a pretty uh, significant body of work that's going to continue for, for at least several months, uh, I would say. Many. On to uh, patient safety risk. We are seeing our, uh, at, at, as of today, from July 19th to today, we've seen 230 events in total that have been entered. So utilization remains very strong. Um, we are working right now on system optimization of RL data so we can get patient safety reporting uh, completed. We have uh, a myriad of safety, uh, patient safety related measures that we will be following, such as medication, adverse events, errors, uh, falls, uh, workplace violence, safety events, uh, et cetera. There's, there's quite a menu. So we'll be able to show graphics that we'll be able to uh, include in the monthly uh, supplemental board data. We've done a lot of work uh, from the accreditation uh, side of things regarding our findings with DNP. Uh, the submission finalization is going to, is, uh, going to be this week. Uh, we have some final evidentiary pieces we're assembling. Thanks to Tim and his uh, team, we have been able to close out uh, just about every one of our environmental care findings. And we are well on our way regarding the restraints and uh, patient sitter uh, findings as well. As Aaron mentioned, uh, there was restraint training that was offered. That was one of our uh, check marks for uh, completion of that particular plan. So we're in a very good position to have our submission in early to the end. And I'm hoping they'll accept that early so that we can, we can put that to them. Uh, medical staff office has been doing quite a bit of reorganization to better facilitate our medical staff uh, and their credentialing and uh, reapplication process and initial application process. Uh, so we were going to also be working on some standard metrics that are going to be included in the monthly executive summary. And those will primarily be around provider volume. So provider count in, uh, in total compared to a status of oncoming uh, broken down by staff. 
Moving on to uh, organizational education. So we are going to be doing a lot of heavy planning for 2022. We've actually already started. Uh, some of our priorities that we are going to be looking to get uh, accomplished by end of this quarter and beginning of next quarter, uh, first quarter of 2022, uh, clinic nursing competencies, both core and specialty. Uh, we are developing a leadership training course for would be health leaders. We're not just uh, doing this for new leaders, but existing leaders, and also in terms of succession planning, anybody who would be a fill in for a leader, that leader was out for an indeterminate period of time or uh, just who, who's up next? Who's that person that's going to be uh, kind of waiting in the wings to be that, that, uh, that next leader of that department? We're planning skills fairs and simulation maps to support our staff with, uh, with optimal training. Uh, we, we asked our staff to do quite a few uh, health stream uh, learning modules. Uh, we want to supplement that with skills fairs where if we can do a hands-on rather than just a pure didactic approach to uh, education, at a skills fair, let's say I go into one for restraints, I, I attend, I get a sign off by our, by our educator, that, that takes care of my health stream requirement. So it's not necessarily a double dip, it's a, dip, it's a different option for our staff. We tend to be very, very busy and are uh, juggling multiple things at once, a additional um, convenient option to get their uh, training requirements across the and then finally, the thing that we will definitely spend a lot of, of time and effort on in 2022 is the implementation, the formal implementation of team skills. So uh, there is a slide that uh, follows this one that has a little bit more detail of what is involved in team steps. But really, this is a this is a methodology for communication for and ensuring continuity of care, continuity of communication hand off of, of uh, specific duties that are applicable for uh, patients, for uh, safety, quality of care, you name it. Um, and this is, some of these tools are, are in existence and these are just part and parts of what we do every day, so, such as, and here's an example of, of it right here in this slide, the SBAR. So situation background, uh, assessment, recommendations, uh, as, a, as a, a typical communication tool. So an example of how this has worked is, in another organization I, I was at, if the doctor on call was uh, contacted by the staff at three in the morning, uh, the doctor would not take that call or not stay on that call unless that communication was given in as far point. So as an example of, of how these tools have been used in the past, there are certain acronyms like IPASS at the time uh, where that is a standardized modality for how we communicate and how we carry forward our, our care for, for our patients. So very excited to, uh, to roll this out. This is a tried and true methodology that has been in healthcare for uh, a number of years. So I know our educators are very excited to, uh, to begin with this. And that is all I have, unless there are any questions. Any questions for John? Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Moving on to uh, our IT report, Brett. Good afternoon. <clears throat> no slides today, just three really quick bullets. Um, no uh, real status updates on our IT staffing for this month. Uh, we're still at the same uh, count. We have eight open positions we're working on and uh, a little over six months to get those uh, positions filled before our all scripts contract ends. So, working on that diligently. Um, tomorrow, we actually have a, a half-day session with Meditech. Uh, this is our strategic roadmap meeting. They will be on site walking us through a whole variety of Meditech-related things, including the next uh, meaningful update, which is uh, instead of using version numbers, they call it Expanse which has an improved uh, graphical user interface, a very streamlined and simplified interface, as well as uh, some big improvements to revenue. So we uh, so we're reviewing that and what that uh, upgrade will look and feel like. We're also gonna look at ambulat uh, Meditech Ambulatory, which is the, would be a, an alternative for us for our current um, clinic EMR, which is Athena Practice. 
um, and looking at how that functions, what that full integration with Meditech would mean from the flow of patient information, both from the clinic to the hospital and back, um, how their integrated uh, telemedicine works and their integrated virtual assistant works and some of the other benefits that we would get if we looked at uh, Meditech ambulatory. Um, also going to be discussing uh, the Commonwealth relationship that they have. This is a nationwide data exchange, uh, allowing us to uh, be able to look at patient information at other hospitals, even if they're on other EMRs, um, like Epic or, um, uh, you know, I'm blanking on some of the other ones, but uh, uh, we can just look up any patient information and quickly pull it right into our EMR. <clears throat> um, also, by going to Expanse's new modules available to us, a business and clinical analytics, a surveillance module that's very impressive and critical care for our ICU. Um, and then we're gonna wrap it all up by looking at their oncology product for our MAC uh, group and uh, consider that as a possibility. So this is a, a very comprehensive look at all, the, all of the Meditech solutions and things that we don't quite have yet that could really advance um, our, their use of electronic medical record and the flow of information in our organization as well as overall productivity. So it'll be a great, for those who wanna attend, um, we're either gonna be down in the heck or you can watch it online and uh, it should be a, a very good session, a good, a good education for us all to map out where we're going and why we wanna go there. Um, Brett, then, yes. Brett, the question. So you said basically they can go online. Are you going to record this so that basically anybody in the clinics, other areas that aren't able to be on there can go in after hours or whatever? Definitely, because um, obviously this is going through the morning and not all of our providers are going to be able to attend. We are starting at seven to talk about the Meditech ambulatory platform to hopefully catch uh, some of our clinic providers before they start meeting with their patients, at least they can get a, a, a larger portion of that, but uh, to make sure that everybody has a chance to follow in and, and review this later, yes, we are going to record it. Um, then, sure. um, was there another question? Nope. And then the last uh, point I had was regarding the ongoing development of IT governance. So we're kicking off next month uh, two new uh, committees, one for the hospital, which is an IT provider advisory committee. Um, uh, and these committees are very similar, just focused uh, is different between them. Uh, so with the hospital and working with the providers and helping us partner with us on the development of solutions, whether it's in Meditech or other solutions that we have in guiding how we uh, create those solutions for them. And then also uh, separately, a clinic, uh, what I'm calling an IT clinic operations committee made up of providers and, and, and clinic managers um, to talk about the needs of the clinics in the same fashion. Partner uh, with us to how we develop, what we focus on, what we pr prioritize our, our work on in IT and so on. So those will be starting up. Agendas will be going out soon. Um, everybody who uh, is th that this impacts is more than welcome. We're going to try to get a broad span of invites out there uh, so that people can participate and weigh in on the uh, most effective use of IT for our organization. So it's open to anybody who's interested. That's my update for this month. Thank you, Brett. Any questions? A comment. Uh, good, good work there helping Dr. Garth with the uh, with the telephone systems there. That's really important for sure. <laughs> well, we've got a number of initiatives going there. I guess, that's right. Um, Dr. Miller said that uh, uh, I was going to give a quick update. I guess I can clarify. We've kind of got a four-pronged approach and stuff that we're working on in the clinics. One for the phones, which has been a challenge since we went live with Mitel in December. Hopefully we're getting near the end of that. We're actually partnering with the folks at Mitel and the folks who uh, provide us our phone system uh, very deeply in their engineering group, even, and, and the work that they're doing for us. Um, so we're hoping we're getting to the end. We've got another update that we're going to do here very shortly. It's a little bit more testing on a, on a client, and hopefully we'll be wrapping up those challenges shortly. We're also looking at, from an Athena practice standpoint, trying to optimize how that application works. We've got a number of different things going on there. I won't belabor it at this point. 
um, some network analysis to uh, ensure that we have our network optimally architected and uh, to make sure our apps perform as we expect them to, as well expanding as well as expanding our um, access to the internet um, because most things are now well both Meditech and Athena Practice are out in the cloud and more things are going to end up in the cloud just because of economies of scale and efficiency and uh, making sure that we have enough bandwidth and redundancy to be able to do whatever we want to do uh, since we're not going to be have them here in the data center and then the fourth prong is regarding our computers and looking at how we want to upgrade our computers and putting some computers into the exam rooms on mobile arms and uh, some different things there to help just make it a little easier for uh, people to document on, but also improve the performance of the application. So that's a really quickie uh, overview of what's going on in the clinics. Thank you. Moving on to facility update, Tim. Good afternoon. Um, thought I'd give you some visuals of some things we've been working on. Um, so on our live, we have um, last week on the 31st installed a new air handler to replace one that um, had been down for a few weeks, finally been able to get the new one installed. Um, and as we do these projects, just want to make sure that everybody understands that we, we want to make sure now that we have a facilities master plan that when things, you know, don't wait um, to be replaced until construction begins on various areas that we put in the items, new equipment that will not only meet the needs of today, but will meet the needs of the future. Um, so this air handler will be, you know, the air handler that um, it doesn't need to be changed in three or four or five years. If we do any construction in, in these areas, it will support the, the, the future. Um, so, but that unit was installed on the 31st. It was up and running last Friday, um, has been verified for shutdown on fire and is, um, you know, a nice new efficient unit. So excited about that. Um, on to the next slide. We have, um, for per DNV, we had to update our suppression system in the kitchen above the stoves and the fryers. Um, every, our old system was water, um, which a uh, water and grease do not mix, especially when there's a fire. So we had to put in a chemical system um, with a manual pull, manual activation, in case for some reason the system did, did not go off. That system um, was has been inspected, tested, and we had to make a few changes that occurred last night. So we're just waiting for fire marshal sign off on it, but it is operational and does provide a much safer environment for the staff working in the area. Um, on to the next slide. So additional projects that we're, we're working on, just some um, you know, more updates. Um, the town of Coopville has completed all their comments and approvals for the seclusion room and the floral room. Um, right now we're just waiting on DOH approval and for their feedback. Um, once we get that, because this has taken so long, um, we will be, once we have um, final comments from the Department of Health and approval from them, we will um, have the, comp the three companies that have submitted bids on those projects, up their projects, um, pending any changes that were made on drawings. And then we will award those bids and um, move forward with those projects. Um, we are moving forward with the mobile MRI. We have, um, we're getting the, the, working on getting um, approval for the contractor and then go through the permitting um, procedures. And then we will be putting in an MO, M, in a mobile MRI, um, which will really help patient care because we, you know, we have experienced a lot of downtimes with our MRI. They are in process of putting together and building the MRI. Um, we're expecting that to be here sometime around January. Um, RHC, we are expecting survey anytime. Um, Dr. Miller and Chris Tumlin and the uh, Clinic staff, managers, we've all been working on preparing for this survey. Um, on the 27th of August, I did a survey among all the clinics, identified any deficiencies that were um, there. Most of the clinics were looking very good. We did find a couple deficiencies that were um, in the process of um, correcting those. 
and we will be having a mock drill next week for communications um, to complete that portion of the, the survey. Um, our security cameras on the new building, the server um, crashed on those cameras. So we have purchased new cameras for the new building and we're in the process of replacing all of them. There's approximately 40 cameras that we have to re replace one by one, get them set up in the system. And um, so we're working on that. And then mid-September, we will be doing um, roof repair on the Goldie Clinic. It's got an old um, sheet of asphalt up there and we'll be pouring, basically pouring a membrane. We won't be putting a membrane roof on. Um, kind of a new process is that where they actually, it's a liquid and it pours and then it sets up and, and works just as like a membrane. Membranes, you know, with shortage of um, products, uh, membranes are really far off if you order them. And this is kind of the new wave of doing roofing. So it'll help fix a lot of the issues that we've had with um, leaks up at the Goldie Roof Repair or at the Goldie Clinic. Next slide. <clears throat> and, and that is everything that I have at this time. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. My God, you busy? <laughs> you have your hand What's up. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Are there any questions for Tim? None, thank you. Moving on, Pacific Incentive Initiative update. Kevin, are you there? You're muted, Kevin. No. Are you there, Kevin? You're still muted. What's going on today? Okay. There you up. Are we uh, there, there. now? Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Now you can hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right. There are five things that I'd like to take a few minutes to report out on. The first one would be our denials initiative. Second one would be the patient experience uh, initiatives and then uh, strategic planning, financial stewardship and our Employee Engagement Advisory Council. So with denials, we um, have a high degree of coordination taking place now. Uh, we're very happy with that. Uh, not too long ago, we were working with some of the patient financial services frontline, and they were quite frustrated with one department that was not being responsive. And so we got together with them. We, worked out the details and, uh, and have got them working together more collaboratively now. Uh, and, uh, and we're seeing the numbers go down, which is great. So back in March, when uh, a few months into this initiative, we had 280 rejections and denials that were placed on the spreadsheet. By April, that number was down to 187. By May, to 129. And uh, as of July, it uh, was at 79. And so that uh, has been huge. The other thing we have done is we have shifted more and more of our focus um, away from the denials and toward rejections. Rejections are the leading indicator that if not resolved correctly, often lead to a denial. Uh, and so uh, as an example of that, if we uh, look at the lab, uh, they had uh, open items on the spreadsheet. 40 of those were rejections, and only three of them were outstanding denials that, uh, that they needed to work on. And so more and more and more of our work is shifting toward those leading indicators. And so now we're focused in on rejections and looking at what the big rejections are in our way and reverse engineering them and uh, working them out of the process. So with patient experience, we were working with the lab and with diagnostic imaging and uh, looked to reduce um, the delays and also the backlog. 
so that individuals were able in a more timely manner to come in and get the diagnostic imaging tests that they required. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time working out the process, making sure everyone was, uh, was in place. However, uh, the hiring difficulties that we have had has really put a great difficulty in this process. Uh, we are finding that patient access does not have the number of individuals that they need, and we're having a very difficult time hiring them. And as a result, individuals are having a hard time reaching us to schedule their diagnostic imaging tests. And also, the um, individuals in patient access, there aren't enough of them to reach out and really work on that backlog. Uh, and so in the short term, diagnostic imaging has uh, stepped back in and is working hard uh, to try and assist in the scheduling, but it is not where we want to be. It is not the desirable position we want to be in and, uh, and is still imposing some difficulties on uh, many of our patients as they try to schedule their diagnostic imaging tests. So we're working on that one right now and uh, hoping that uh, we're able to figure out how to recruit and uh, bring the right individuals into that department and reduce that backlog. So that is still a work in progress right now. Uh, when it comes to strategic planning, our executive leadership team has been meeting for the last few months, working hard to try and develop the strategic plan for the next few years. And they have done some great work. Uh, that is nearing its completion. And uh, very soon we'll have that ready, uh, first to be published internally so that all employees uh, and stakeholders internally know it, and then uh, ultimately also to put that out to our public so that you're aware that is uh, maturing and is on its way. Um, also, uh, yesterday we met as an executive leadership team uh, when it comes to financial stewardship and took um, a hard look at our revenue model and uh, the unique challenges of being a critical access hospital and uh, have been looking at uh, what specific initiatives we can tackle that, uh, that will help uh, to further strengthen the financial position of, uh, of the organization. Uh, and so that is an active conversation that is also an ongoing work in progress. And, uh, and then finally, with our Employee Engagement Advisory Council, we um, have been working on the naming protocols and have all of that in place now. Uh, and now we're focused in on the communications that will be going out, making sure that uh, the communications that are sent out connect well with our uh, employees and providers as that uh, employee engagement survey goes out. We'll be looking to send that survey out at the end of this month. Uh, and so we're, we're working hard to get all of that in place. Um, Greta, there was uh, a group that reached out to you that had uh, indicated a desire to be part of that advisory council, um, but they did not leave a name. And so I, uh, I've reached out to those groups, hoping that uh, someone might uh, raise their hand and uh, join us in that, but I haven't heard anything. So if if you do have the information and are able to do a reply to the email, uh, I uh, would like to invite them, but I don't have a name and so I, I can't go directly to them and invite them individually. Um, and, uh, and so that's the only thing that would prevent me from moving forward on, uh, on in that invitation. Otherwise, those are the key initiatives that we've been focused on. And um, with that, I will hand it back for questions. Any questions from the board? Hearing none, uh, thank you, Kevin. Yep. All good. <laughs> We're going to the bottom of the list. <laughs> Administrator's report, Mr. Kellett. Well, you've heard a lot today. Uh, you heard uh, that we've had staffing issues. There's been some uh, major staffing issues as relates to COVID. Um, you know, it, it is affecting all our organization from nursing to entry level positions. You've heard some good news on our P&L. 
bad news in our cash. Uh, you heard um, clinics. The biggest issue is provider shortages. Uh, they are hurting for providers. Uh, we're doing everything we can. Uh, you heard in the nursing report, get the vaccine. Plain and simple, get the vaccine. You heard from MIPS or from from quality, a MIPS score, and it was uh, a positive. I mean, it really, if we do good in quality, we get reimbursed from Medicare. That is good news. And we heard um, that Brett is going to have a Meditech expanse demo. You know, that that is all really good. Um, good news, but I will say it's it somehow doesn't take into account the patient experience. Um, and I had a personal experience I want to share with you. Um, last Tuesday, um, I was, uh, well, let me just say, last Tuesday was an event for me. I was down when the count. I was, um, so, uh, let me give it to you. I guess I was at home at night, and I was feeling weak. So I was really going to pass out. And um, Mary, who was with me, uh, said, hey, you know what? I'm going to call the EMS. No, I don't call the EMS. Don't call the EMS as a guy. And uh, But then I went out. I completely fainted. Uh, and so she panicked. I really didn't want an EMS. I came to, didn't want an EMS. I got EMS there. Good thing. Um, it was a good thing. Is um, I was no heartbeat. There was no blood pressure, and I was out. Seals EMS came in and saved my life. They were tremendous at that. They were in, um, didn't care who I was, didn't care if I was the CEO, and they knew it, um, but no, they didn't care. They just cared about me as a person. I went to ER, same thing. They didn't care who I was. They just cared that I was going to survive. Um, and then, uh, unbeknownst to me, well, unbeknownst to me, I did know that I was allergic to shrimp. You know, it is a, I could not resist the shrimp. Uh, it was, it, it was, it was poor planning on my part. Uh, for, uh, so I did have a tremendous effect on the shrimp, um, to the fact that, uh, uh, as you know, I blacked out, and um, anyways, so going through ER, great great service. Going through observation, they wanted to admit me, observation, great services. I mean, the I was here about 12, 18 hours, I don't know, and I really am very fortunate to be uh, here. I... Um, I, I, I make no doubt that I was scared, I was disoriented, I was, um, uh, for lack of a better word, I was embarrassed. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Now, because of that, um, because of that experience I had, it made me realize this, this community needs this hospital community needs us to be here. Uh, it doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what it takes. It doesn't matter our financial situation. It matters that we're here. Uh, you know, I I, I don't um, I don't well let me just say I fear that COVID has really to Our detriment it has taxed our community, and that they won't have the resources 
available. If we're in here, we will have to transfer to pay to patients. Now, you know, where do they go? Can't transfer them to across the bay. Can't transfer them anywhere because they're all full. We have taxed because of COVID. We have taxed um, the rural health care, not just here, everywhere. Rural health care is being inundated with tax with the COVID. Um, we are. I want to say it. We are independent. And we are rural, and those are most important to us. We want to stay independent. We want to stay rural. I mean, we, we really do. And so um, all this can be fixed by having a vaccine. All this can be fixed. And not eating shrimp. And not eating shrimp. All this can be fixed by the fact of getting the vaccine, getting it, getting it uh, throughout our system, getting it throughout our, our people. Now, it is sad that it took a tremendous effect on me but it is really, really um, important for us to know that this community needs this hospital more than ever. So with that, say I do. Ron, I think every board member and, and somebody in the staff have used this facility. That's right. And you know, until you get in that position, you kind of have a feeling, okay, we're doing the right thing here and everything, but we have such a great staff. Our, our EMS system is fantastic. The ER people are fantastic. The, the staff here, even the food is fantastic. <laughs> but, but like I said, people don't realize what a gem we have and why so many of the board members and, and others, we all fight for this place. You know, we, we do want it to stay here. We want it to be independent because that provides that upper level of, of care. That when you're independent, you're not just a clinic that's a pass-through. That you know, you come here, you're very important. And like I said, it doesn't matter your title. Yeah, doesn't matter. Everybody the same. And you know, I'm I'm sad you got the experience, yeah, but I'm glad right. you got it because it does give you a first hand. And like I said, none of us want to be there, but when we've gone through it, it's been great to know, you know, what it is. And like I said. You know, when sometimes you come in and it's like, if they can't take care of you here, they know exactly where and they'll make the arrangements, you know, and, and you know, basically they, they make sure that you survive and get back. Like I said, I, I think, it, you know, like I said, I'm sorry you went through it, but I'm glad you did. Well, the fact it, that you experienced it and you see it, how good we really are here. We are amazing. And now I do have an EpiPen. So, yes, uh, you, and, and, uh, uh, Aaron, you will be glad to know it's in my desk, upper right-hand drawer of the EpiPen. Oh, I shouldn't bring you any more of the shrimp, don't you? I know, no more shrimp. I swear that is the scariest thing I've ever had. Uh, it is a a really uh, struggle. I think, uh, Jake, are you there? Uh, Jake there? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay, Jake, on the agenda, you know, we're scheduled to go into executive session. Is that going to happen? And yes. then basically, do you have a call in for the other board members to call in on? Uh, yeah, the executive session is to talk about uh, current and pending litigation and the um, call in information, I believe. Let me see if it's been sent out. I have it on my calendar, but I don't know if. Why, why don't you forward it to everyone? Okay. Nancy and Greta. And Nancy and Greta. Okay. Get that I will forward that out. And is there anything else on any public comments that you needed to bring forward or not? No, the, the public comment period had ended at the conclusion of the beginning. Yeah. Be at the beginning. No, okay. Greta might have a question. Dr. Cameron Meyer, you have a question? Well, the, the only. Or anything or do anything or whether this was the end of the, the commissioner's meeting and then just going into the executive yeah i should have said that that basically we'll adjourn this meeting to go into executive session there will be no votes taken uh just for information only uh so there's nothing else so we could take a motion to adjourn to adjourn 
Move to adjourn. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Our next meeting is October 13th at 12 o'clock, and it will be a virtual meeting like this was, unfortunately, but it is what it is. Thank you.